Inside the Birds is back. What's going on, everybody? Jeff Mosher alongside Adam Kaplan. And as we promised, we deliver. We have with us the great tape breakdown artist, Greg Cassell. What's going on, Greg? How you doing? Thanks for joining us on Inside the Birds. God, I feel like I should be like on a trapeze the way you said that. You know, I should be uh, trying to balance. We get on a fired up here. <laughs> yeah, Greg, good to be with you. So, so before we get started here, I got to ask you this one question. What has your week been like leading up? Because I know you're going to be you're taping some shows this week for the matchup show. Well, the last three weeks, the excitement of my life has been trying to figure out when to take a walk and when to shower. Yes. That's been the excitement <laughs> in my life. <laughs> and waiting for the next meal. Um but uh, no, actually, we're, we're taping two matchup shows on Friday. That One will air Monday night on ESPN2 at 7.30. The second will air Tuesday night on ESPN at 7 p.m. Uh, so the last week or so, I've been, I've been pretty focused, pretty busy. It's, it's kind of weird doing it from home. There are some people at NFL Films. They're trying to obviously limit the number of people. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been a little different. I haven't been able quite... To, to watch tape the way I would normally like to because I live five minutes from NFL Films. So I've kind of made it a, a deal in my life not to work at home. So it's been a little crazy. But, you know, you make do. We all make do. That's what the world is now. Well, we still trust, Greg, that, uh, you know, you're going to have great inside information for us or tape breakdown information, I should, I should say. Uh, we've got a bunch of positions, got a bunch of players we want to ask you about. Obviously, Eagles, this is an Eagles podcast, but we do get into – uh, other NFL teams, what they're looking at, and we want your opinion and expertise on all the guys that you've seen on tape. Real quick, uh, for those who are new to the podcast, they can follow me on Twitter, at Jeff Mosher NFL. Adam's on Twitter, at Kaplan NFL. And Greg Cassell can be found at Greg Cassell, one S, two L's. Greg Cosell, one S, two L's on Twitter. Uh, just want to let everybody know we've started, uh, we're up on Facebook now. We've got the Inside the Birds Facebook page, and along with that, we have the Inside the Birds Facebook message group. So make sure you go to the Inside the Birds Facebook page, find the invitation to the message board group. And uh, already we've got about, I think, 350 to 400 people already. And the conversations have begun. They've been good conversations, good questions, good interactions with Inside the Birds fans uh, and, and their feelings on the NFL draft and the Eagles. So we encourage everybody to head on over there. So we're going to get right into it. We'll start asking Greg his uh, feelings on some of these guys. We're going to pause one second, though, for a word from our great sponsors. Hey, it's Jeff Mosher. Adam Kaplan and I love using Anchor for our Inside the Birds podcast every week. It's so user-friendly, anyone can create their own podcast, and you should too. Just download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Anchor gives you everything you need to start your own podcast from your phone or computer. Its creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast per, for a professional sound, and Anchor will distribute your podcast for you to Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and so many other platforms. It can be heard by everyone, just like Inside the Birds. You can also make money from your pod with no minimum listenership. What are you waiting for? Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to create your podcast today. The Earn Your Leisure podcast, hosted by Rashard Blau and Troy Millings, examines the latest trends in finance. Listen as the duo interviews entrepreneurs from various industries as they break down their business models and share some of their hardships and triumphs that they've experienced along the way. Want to learn about the real estate game? Unclear how the stock market works? They gotcha. Interested in starting a truck company, vending machine business, or investing in the mobile home market? Then check them out as they've got you covered. Earn Your Leisure is a college business class mixed with pop culture. So if you want to become better equipped in business, head over to Spotify or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and follow the Earn Your Leisure podcast today so you never miss an episode. All right, Greg, uh, I think it's best. Uh, it's weird. Even though this is an Eagles podcast, I think we're going to start off with quarterbacks because what your evaluation of quarterbacks, what you've seen, and then obviously the idea that if quarterbacks go higher, if there's three, four, or even you know five that go in the top 10 or 15, it pushes other prospects down right in the draft. So other prospects that teams that don't need a quarterback like the Eagles might be looking at. But I want to start with quarterbacks with you. It's been a long journey, I guess, offseason for Tua, uh, Tunglevaya from Alabama and all the injuries and everything. But just from a, from a tape perspective, when you compare Tua and, say, Justin Herbert, um, what do you see as the strengths of those? And, and are there certain schemes you feel that, that each quarterback fits best? 
Well, I'll say this to start. Almost every quarterback is a system quarterback. That's not a negative pejorative term. There's not many quarterbacks that are scheme transcendent. There's always a few. Certainly someone like Patrick Mahomes is, but there's, there's always a few. But almost every quarterback works best in a particular scheme that fits what his traits are. So you mentioned Tua and Herbert. They're totally different players. Tua is a highly rhythm timing based player. He needs that kind of scheme. If he were to reach his NFL ceiling, he would have to play stylistically like a Drew Brees. He's a rhythmic player. Justin Herbert is not that kind of player at all. Justin Herbert does not have what I would call ball distributor traits. Justin Herbert is more along the lines of, let's say, someone like Josh Allen. So it's a totally different style player. Herbert is not a, a great timing player. He's not a true rhythm player. He's more of what I call, and Adam knows this because we've talked for years about quarterbacks. He's what I've always called a see-it-throw-it quarterback. His sense of anticipation is not high level. Even a lot of his completions, he's a beat or two late. So you have to try to project and transition that to the league because normally in the NFL, if you're a beat or two late, you can get yourself in a little bit of trouble. Now, there are some quarterbacks that can have success like that, uh, but at times it will get them in, tr in trouble. Little was a good example of that. Big arm. He was a see it, throw it quarterback. Made great throws, but at times got in trouble. Greg, when you look at Herbert, and I saw this with Dak Prescott, they the ball's going to get there because they've got good arm talent. Herbert Herbert's an interesting player because he's got so much ability. But as you've studied tape for the decades that you've done it, can this be coached out of him in terms of getting rid of the ball faster? Throwing with anticipation. Can, can that be taught? Um, I, I don't know if it can be taught the way you're thinking about it. What you can do is through your, your route concepts and combinations, you can try to create that. And that's where when you study film, you have to try to figure out, and it's not always easy, the difference between anticipation and predetermination. Because a lot of times with route concepts, you can pretty much say, hey, here's our route concept. Here's the coverage we're anticipating based on our tape study, and therefore it makes it appear as if the quarterback is throwing with anticipation. But it's really more predetermination. It's sometimes it's very difficult to figure out the difference between the two. Greg, before you, we get out of the quarterbacks here, one guy I do want to talk about is Jordan Love, because when I talk to offensive coaches, they seem to be split. That he, he, and certainly he's polarizing to a point because he's got a lot of ability, but there, there's some flaws here. When you talk about traits, does he have the type of traits that can make it to the next level? Uh, what, what kind of quarterback could he be uh, going to the NFL? Well, he's a traits quarterback. He's very toolsy. And there are times watching him. I remember studying him last summer after his 2018 season, and I made a note that I thought he'd be a top 10 pick in the draft oh. after 2019, of course, with normal improvement. But this year, the numbers weren't quite, quite as good. There were some concerns. In fact, when I do my sheets, I have strengths, weaknesses, transition, and I had seven weaknesses, which is a lot when I do a, a particular player. And there's much he needs to work on. He, he, there were too many inaccurate passes, his, his base and his balance. He had issues with that at times, but he does have a good arm. He's an over the top thrower. He's got more ball distributor type traits than let's say Justin Herbert. He certainly can make throws on the move. These secondary action plays have become more important in the NFL. To me, he's going to become very much a function as most quarterbacks are of coaching scheme overall team players around him five or six factors that will come into play he's a quarterback that if he doesn't make it i guarantee in a year two years three years a lot of people say told you so told you so mm. but there'll be so many factors that will dictate whether he really has success but he's got traits to have success greg real quick and i know that you know mock drafting isn't your thing but um <laughs> you've seen the how the draft goes do you feel that based on your study of the four borough to, to uh, you know, Justin and Jordan Love that, and I'll, I'll even throw Eason in there. Um, do you feel like there's a good chance that at least four of these guys go in the first round? They're quarterbacks, Jeff. You know that. That's what's yeah. going to happen. I mean, we know that three will more than likely go in the top ten. Love mm -hmm. will be the wild card. Eason will be a little bit of a wild card simply because he's sort of traditional prototypical. 
Uh, you know, if Eason was coming out 20 years ago, people would probably talk about him as a top five pick. But because the game has changed and there's more of a focus on the quicker pass game and second reaction improvisational plays, Eason does not quite fit that mold. But someone could fall in love with Eason because it comes out so easily. I've been around him numerous times. I stood next to him at the combine as he was throwing. You know, Eason's one of those guys that just looks so easy throwing the ball. Would you bang your, your fist on the table for any of these guys becoming a superstar? Well, I really like Burrow. I think Burrow has everything you want other than ideal arm strength. I would probably rate his arm as just above average. Mm -hmm. But as I said, the game's changed. There's so much more quick game. And by quick game, I don't just mean three-step drop, throw a slant or a hitch. Quick game to me also is the the quick five-step game, the play-action game. Think of Tom Brady with that quick game off play-action. You know, for years he'd hit Gronk on those quick in-breakers, you know, it would hit Elman on those kinds of throws. The NFL passing game has changed. And Burrow has such a, an innate ability to slide and move both within the pocket and outside the pocket, and he's precisely accurate. So to me, Burrow is the number one quarterback in this draft class. Jeff, you want to move to receiver? Yeah, let's go to receiver. Um, I mean, we probably have a million questions for you on receiver, uh, Greg, but I, I guess the, the, the first one that comes to my mind is – Trying to compare and contrast Jerry Judy and CeeDee Lamb, who will probably be the two guys taken off the board. Uh, they both obviously have unbelievable talents, but when you watch both of them, is there one of them that you are more convinced will be successful in the NFL than the other, or do you think they're both headed to be really good players? How do you feel about those two in particular? Well, I'm on record. I think that this draft class is, is receivers, Jerry Judy and everybody else, but I know mm -hmm. I'm in the minority. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just to me, Judy is just so advanced as a as a route runner, has an unbelievable understanding of how to run routes, has great quickness. Um, you know, I just see and, and he's better vertically. He's an example of a player that has much better play speed than time speed. And in fact, in a matchup show, I'm showing two vertical routes because I wanted to make that point. Um, so to me, Judy is is the best receiver in this draft class. Uh, as I said, I talked to a number of offensive coordinators at the Combine. Some felt that way. Some liked Lamb. So smart, reasonable people will have different points of view on that. Um, I like Lamb. You know, it's funny when you do these, Jeff, and, and Adam certainly knows this, based mm -hmm. on what I just said, people are now going to think, oh, he hates Lamb. <laughs> I, I don't. Hate I mean, Adam, you know how that goes. I know. Yep. I know. I know. We know. I, know. <laughs> I just think Judy is, has special traits. I think Lamb is a really good prospect. I'm just curious. Um, you know, I think Lamb is, is, is he, I, don't, I don't view Lamb as sudden or explosive. I think he's smooth and fluid. Um, I think he's a little straight line. I think he's got some spectacular run after catch plays when he has room to run after the catch. I don't think he's as shifty and elusive and as loose-hipped as Judy. Um, so the question with Lamb is, and the game has also changed where receivers play a lot of different positions. I don't see Lamb as we speak today as a true X. He might develop into that. I think to me, Lamb right now is much more of a movement Z or a slot uh, and, and could be very, very good at it. But I think he'll need some development. Let me ask you a question on Jerry Judy. You've seen John Gruden's offense with the Raiders. You, you, you studied it. You saw him with the Bucks, of course. Is Judy a guy who could line up anywhere for John Gruden? I think Judy can line up anywhere. Um, you know, Judy what did line up in the slot a lot at Alabama. Um, as, by the way, Lamb lined up in the slot a lot at, uh, at Oklahoma. 42% of, of Lamb's receptions this year came out of the slot. And I think Judy's numbers were similar as far as receptions. You know, Judy had uh, a much, actually a higher percent, 70%. But Judy lined up outside as well. Um, you know, Lamb, it's funny. They're both about the same height. But Lamb just looks like a taller guy, even though they're about the same. So they're just different. Um, I think either one could fit John Gruden's offense. I think either one at 11 could fit Adam Gase's offense if he chose to go receiver at 11. Um, uh, I just think Judy has better overall receiving traits and is a far more refined, advanced receiver at this point. Let me ask you this question on Henry Ruggs. Is he just a a... Deep threat, elite deep threat, or does he, does he have more to his game from your, your coach? I think he has setting? more to his game. 
And in fact, that's one reason I really enjoy watching full games because I could show you plays where he did not get the ball, where he ran phenomenal routes and beat hmm. quality corners, but the ball wasn't thrown to him. Um, I think Ruggs is, is a guy who can be really effective at all three levels as a route runner. We know about his speed. I think he fits the NFL game with his ability to take it to the house on short throws. Plus, you can use him on uh, jet sweeps, orbit reverses. I think in many ways he's scheme transcendent. The only issue would have you'd have with rugs, if it's an issue, and we know Adam and Jeff, some teams, this is important. He's only 188 pounds. So some might look at him and think, oh, he's small. But as far as that, everything else, he's, I think he's pretty interesting. He's not physical in a strict sense, but he's highly competitive. That's interesting because one of my questions I was going to ask you was how much um, when you're talking about Lamb, Ruggs, Judy, do you factor in the type of quarterback that you have? You know, the Raiders, they've got a guy in Derek Carr who does not drive the ball down the field a whole lot. Uh, Sam Darnold at times, I think we've yet to see what Dan, you know, Darnold's really going to be. The Eagles have a guy like Carson right. Wentz. So I wonder if – if, you know, if Ruggs' speed is his best trait, but you have a quarterback who doesn't necessarily look to drive the ball, is that not a great match compared to if a Judy or a Lamb are available and they can do a little bit more from a route running standpoint? Well, keep in mind that today's deeper throws, for the most part, are scripted deeper throws. You mm -hmm. know, if you're talking about, let's say, posts um, or back shoulder throws, these are scripted plays. There are not many teams – even though some have the methodology of, let's say, the, the greatest show on turf, the, the Mike Martz offense, there's not many teams that make those kinds of 18 to 22-yard intermediate throws with regularity. It's in everyone's offense, but the NFL game has changed. There's not that many of those kinds of throws as a normal part of pass games. So I think verticals now are scripted much more so, and any quarterback can make those throws. Mm -hmm. and you know, any receiver can theoretically run those routes. Certainly rugs can run anything vertically. Um, I think he's a great speed cut type runner. Those kinds of routes are kind of lost in today's NFL. That's what the Rams did. That's what that offense did when, when it was more in vogue in the league. Uh, Isaac Bruce was a master at it. He went in the hall of fame this year. I think Henry Ruggs has those kinds of route running traits. Je uh, guys, one guy I want to bring up, Justin Jefferson, Greg. <laughs> Justin Jefferson yeah. needs to be in every mock to the Eagles at 21. You know, talking to coaches the last couple of weeks about him, they all seem to think that, yeah, he did play outside in 2018, but at their level, they just think he can only play inside. But you've graded the tape. What did you see from Justin Jefferson? Well, this year he was a pure slot receiver. The previous year he played a lot on the outside. So the question becomes, what do you think he is? Your point's a, a great one, and you, uh, you've talked to coaches. Um, you have to decide what he is. If you see him purely as a slot, he can still be a really good player. And by the way, he's very smooth. He's very polished. I wouldn't call him sudden or explosive, but he's got a really refined sense of pace and tempo as a route runner. He catches the ball really well. Um, I think he can develop into a Robert Woods kind of player. And Robert Woods is a really good player. Oh, he's deep threat though, sure. right? Yeah. What's that? Is it, but doesn't Wood, Woods... I know Woods will line up inside. Plays but theoretically he's... outside for the Rams. Right. The Rams are a big reduced split offense, so he's not lining up that much outside the numbers. Right, right, right. You know, but, so, but... so I guess my point would be I don't see Jefferson, let's say, as a boundary X where he's going to have to win outside on isolation routes. Now, maybe some teams see him that way. That's certainly not what he did at LSU this past year. But so if you view him as purely a slot, that's okay. So the question is, when you draft him, then you have to know that. And then you have to decide how he fits your offense. If you're talking about the Eagles and you feel they need, they need speed on the outside, yes. uh, of course, they're, they're assuming Deshaun Jackson's back being Deshaun Jackson. But if you're still looking for speed at the other wide out on the, on the edge, Jefferson may not be your guy. Would you feel comfortable if you were the Eagles and you alternate, Greg, between – 11 and 12 personnel where every time you're 11 he's your slot receiver but when you go to that 12 personnel and maybe you're inside the red zone you stick him outside and try to back shoulder him a little bit as you said he's not got great uh tape speed so but can you with his 33 inch arms do you think you can find areas on the outside where you can win with him you probably can um the question is how often 
Um, right. You know, obviously he's, he's, I think he's over six one. Um, he's kind of lanky, you know, he's not necessarily physical per se. Um, I don't know if there's a vertical dimension to his game. Uh, he's a little upright as a route runner. I wouldn't mm-hmm. say he's an explosive athlete. Um, so can you? Sure, because that's what teams do, and the Eagles certainly do that. The Eagles move their receivers around quite a bit. You know, when, when Jeffrey was was sort of in his prime with the Eagles, he was when they went to an X receiver, he was the X, but he also lined up in multiple positions. So the Eagles mm-hmm. move receivers around. So Jefferson theoretically is a fit, but I wouldn't draft him to say, okay, now we have our boundary X, we're ready to go. Greg, one of the – just talking to a bunch of coaches, they seem to all love Brandon Ayuk from Arizona State. They know he's not quite a burner, but he's incredible running after the catch. Give us an idea at the next level how you think he could fit in. Well, he's an explosive guy, and he's very well built. Um, the majority of his catches at ASU came with him outside the numbers, but he did align in different positions. To me, he's at this point in his career – He's a space guy. You want to get him the ball on the move where he can utilize his explosive traits. Vertical routes, in-breakers at the short and intermediate levels, multiple screen concepts, jet sweeps, reverses. You want to get him the ball not where he stopped with his back turned to the quarterback, but where he's on the move because that's the kind of receiver he is right now. I think there's much development for him, and we could be talking in three years about him being really, really good. And again, now it's coaching. It's how he's deployed. It's who, who he's playing with. You know, if he plays with an accurate quarterback who can put the ball right on his hands as he's moving, he could be an explosive player. Because at the end of the day, run after catch is – more often than not a function of the quarterback, not the receiver. Right. We're talking with the great Greg Cassell from uh, NFL Film, senior producer, co-host of the NFL Matchup Show on ESPN. Greg, when a lot of the times we talk about these guys, and this is considered one of the best classes of wide receivers in a long time, maybe ever, and yet we seem to be having discussions about a good many of them either needing more development, being a better slot or a Z or a movement player, than a pure X. So I'm I'm kind of reconciling how this is one of the great wide receiver classes, but it does seem like there's going to be a lot of really, really good number two receivers in the NFL uh, moving forward because uh, only a few of these guys get the true X label. Is that is that accurate? Is that fair? Probably. I, I would look at this draft and say that there's a lot of big wide outs, and I'm really curious to see how the league responds and views big wide outs. Like, I really like Michael Pittman. To me, Michael Pittman is one of the best receiving prospects in this draft class. He's 6'4", 223. I think you can line him up as an X. Um, Mm -hmm. Denzel Mims, I think you can line him up as an X. I think he needs some work, but I think you could line him up as an X. These are all bigger receivers. So, you know, in some ways, it's like we talked about with quarterbacks. There's not 50 Julio Jones, you know, so Mm -hmm. receivers become – dependent on their usage and their deployment. And that's just the way it is. You know, everybody wants, particularly first round picks, you know, and and with no other sports going on now, we're even nitpicking all this stuff on social media even more than we usually do. Um, So, you know, everybody is deciding if a guy's going to be drafted 15th and he's got to be a Hall of Famer. It doesn't quite work that way. You know, guys get used in a certain way and you have to understand coaches anyway have to feel that they have a good understanding of how a particular player can be deployed to maximize what his skill set is. Jeff and Jeff and I have been talking about Jalen Rager a lot on our show and he's very intriguing. So, so based on your tape study, where do you think Rager should line up or can he line up at a variety of spots at the next level? Uh, He can probably line up in a variety of spots. He predominantly lined up on the outside at TCU. Um, he came in at 206 at the combine, which is pretty, pretty muscular. Um, some might see him as a slot. He certainly has juice to him. Uh, he played with some twitch and some speed. He was able to get on the top of over the top of college corners. Um, I'm in the minority here, but I actually thought he showed some nuance as a route runner. I thought he showed a sense of how to run routes, which leads me to believe as he's taught more, he'll understand it. Um, I liked him the more I watched him. I think he can line up all over your formation. I think he can be a matchup piece in addition to being utilized on jet sweeps and reverses. I think he's an interesting prospect. And, you know, again, 
because he's under six feet. Now you get into how teams see him. Who would you, if you, if I asked you who you bang the table most for Rager, Mims or Ayuk, which one are you taking? Oh, um, I like Mims. I, you know, again, I think these are all receivers that have some work to do, mm-hmm. uh, but I think Mims, just the way he moves, uh, there's something about Mims I really liked on tape. I mean, he's tall, he's rangy. He, he ran a four three eight. Now he doesn't have that kind of time speed as a player, but he's got track speed. You know, I mean, he's he he doesn't have track speed. Excuse me, he's got sort of tri- stride length speed. And and I like Mims. I think. Assuming he's a good kid, I, I guess you guys interviewed him. Yeah, um, yeah, he's a great kid. Yeah, he very really nice. Is. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah, assuming he works hard and all that, yeah. I just think the way he moves, his body type, um, his ability to be successful on isolation routes and one-on-one matchups, his ability to work the middle of the field, I like Mims a lot. Now, you know, having said that, I'm not going to sit here and tell you he's a top ten pick, or you know, but I think in the right situation, I think he could be a really good player. Uh, KJ Hamler, Greg, smaller player, a uh, slot player, you think the next level, where do you see him uh, lining up at the next level? Yeah, I saw him that way. I know a lot of people I respect think he's Deshaun Jackson. Um, I guess I didn't quite see him that way. I know that there are people who do that I really respect. So, you know, to me, he was a slot guy. I think he's, he is small. A um, couple of things concern me. Small guys like that. And he really looked small on tape. You know, if you're going to be a slot, you're going to have to deal with where the, the bodies are, bigger bodies. Curious about that. I don't think he was a natural pass catcher. I thought he had a lot of drops. Um, I thought his hands were very spotty. Um, I thought it was interesting. He, he Almost all of his catches came from the slot, but he had numerous snaps where he did line up on the outside. And I thought from the slot, he was vertically explosive. But I thought from the outside, he was not vertic- as vertically explosive. Hmm. I thought there was a difference, which led me to make a point in my notes that from the outside, I didn't think he was a Miko Hardman type guy, but from the inside, I thought that he did show vertical explosion. It might just be a comfort thing. Was that because he was slowed down by jams or are you, are you even talking about with free releases on the outside? Um, Usually from the slot, you don't, you don't usually get jammed. So of course, right. that's a good point, Jeff. If you have free access, you can burst off the line, and he certainly has burst to him. Um, on the outside, very often you need a little bit of, even if it's not a physical jam, you need a little bit of a pause, so to speak, to kind of get past the corner. And, you know, maybe that was a problem for him. Jeff, next position? Yeah, let's go on to uh, pass rushers or now, uh, you know, the edge rushers. Um, I think, you know, for, from an Eagle standpoint, Greg, it would be interesting if a guy like the kid from LSU fell there and a bunch of receivers went off the board already and, you know, who fits? You know, I, I think about him and, and Yatur Gross Matos from Penn State. What, what do you think about Jason and, and, and Gross Matos for, from that standpoint? What schemes do you see those guys excelling in? Well, Gross Matos, to me, he's a long, slippery kind of guy. He's got really good length. Um, you know, I think he's got a lot of traits that lead you to believe he could become a really good edge rusher particularly from a wide nine. Um, I don't think he's physical, you know, as physical as you would like, but I think with his, his ability to, to, to use his length, he can be very effective that way. Chase on is, is, I really like chase on on film. Now he had a lot of snaps where he did struggle and he's only 20 years old and he only played 26 games at LSU. So I think that he has development to do, but I think he's a high-level edge prospect who's just scratching the surface of what he can be. As I said, he needs some work, but he's very athletic. He showed the ability to bend, kind of that motorcycle lean, if you can picture that. Um, so, you know, he was a guy, and I watched a ton of LSU for obvious reasons, but he was a guy that that I just really, really liked. And I think he could become a really good player, but you might not see it as a rookie. And you know how it goes. If it's at the 21st pick or if they – trade up, let's say, and take a guy, fans will expect that that player should be a big contributor right away. Yeah, Chason is kind of looked at as a developmental guy uh, for a little bit down the line, needs to refine some part of his skill, but his athleticism might be the best of really anyone. It's uh, it's a guy that coaches really like, but they know he needs a little bit more time. Uh, When we look at um, other edge rushers, um, Greg, when you you graded uh, the tape, 
Did you think it was a deep class? Because this talking to coaches, they thought it was better no. for just 43 linebackers. Yeah, exactly. So who are no. some of the other guys that you like? I mean, I think the kid from Alabama is really interesting, Terrell Lewis. Um, another kid that was hurt a lot. Uh, so he didn't play that many games. Um, I think he'll be polarizing as a prospect. Um, he's high cut and he's long limbed and a lot of people will be bothered by that. Um, because when you have long legs like that, that at times limits your ability to bend and be flexible and change direction off the edge. Um, but yet his tape at times showed the ability to do that. So there were times you watched him and you went, wow. And he actually showed a dynamic inside spin move. So, you know, I think he had enough lateral quickness and change of direction to be effective with counter moves. Uh, so when you look at him, there's a lot to work with from a size, length, athleticism standpoint. But I think that, you know, and again, I'm not good at this. I think there'll be some people that could say he's a second round player and some people that could say he's a fourth round player. You know, I don't do grades. Fewer teams do grades than people think, by the mm -hmm. way, as you probably know that, Adam. Yep. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. Some teams are very grade based what round other teams are, don't worry about round they grade players you know and put a board together like the patriots say, yeah yeah they, they don't necessarily say oh he's a third round pick right right talking with greg cosell from nfl films and of course the nfl matchup show on espn greg i was uh talking with an afc personnel guy i think yesterday or the day before he's high on at least the athleticism that he's seen from that the notre dame edge rusher uh julian okwara i hope i got Quara. his name right and you also like the Florida guys, uh, Zuniga and Grenard. Are, are any of those uh, guys yeah. – are, are they scheme <laughs> transcendent? Like can they play 4-3-3-4 four, three, three, four, or are they more geared for one than the other? Well, Zuniga was a guy that was as fascinating a prospect as I watched from the defensive side of the ball mm -hmm. because, man, does he look the part as, as a pass rusher. He is long and he's athletic and he showed flashes of explosive athleticism. I guarantee there'll be defensive line coaches that look at this kid and say, man, I want to coach this kid because hmm. he really, really looked the part. He's long limbed. He's got burst. I mean, if he can develop a wider array of moves, I think he has a chance to be really good. Now he also lined up inside and was able to win inside as well. So he kind of fits the NFL now where more and more teams are very multiple with their fronts. The Eagles are not quite as multiple like that, although they do often bring Brandon Graham inside. There'll be times Cox moves to the outside. But the Eagles are not, let's say, the Patriots, you know, mm -hmm. that school of thought where they move people constantly around with their front. Um, Okwara is kind of similar. Okwara is another guy that really, really looks the part. I mean, he's 6'4", 250. He's got long arms. He's got a tremendous wingspan. He's got that long, athletic, rangy build. He's got that burst of flexibility to clear the edge. Um, I think it's important, though, to understand what he is and what he isn't. You know, he's not a strong run defender at this point. He's not very physical. But, you know, he's got pass rush traits. And those long guys, people love those long guys, especially if they can bend a little bit. Mm. All, All right, right let's move on. We're going to do corners and safeties, uh, Greg, because I know that that's a, another area that Eagles fans are really keying in on. So I want to ask you about corner. I'm going to think that Okuda is gone and, and probably C.J. Henderson when the Eagles pick. Uh, after, after that, it kind of feels like a, you know, just what do you like? If you're the Eagles, you, you know the scheme that Jim Schwartz plays and you're looking for a little bit of speed on the outside are you a, a Tra Travon Diggs fan a Gladney fan a, I, I personally like Jalen Johnson I know he just had uh, right. a, a procedure but who do you think fits Jim Schwartz's scheme uh, the best of, of the after Okuda and Henderson um well I like Diggs a lot um you know I think that um Diggs to me and and he's long he's athletic he's he can run. Um, he's physical. He's tough. He's competitive. Diggs was a guy, the more I watched, the more I liked. Now, I don't know whether he's for everybody, you know, I, I, you know, but he was really physical and press. You know, more and more teams play man coverage now. That's the way the NFL has moved. Um, you know, I, I think you need to be able to play press man. And uh, I thought he was one of the better corner prospects in this draft class, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, Johnson's probably an interesting guy as well. He's long. He's competitive. He plays the ball well. 
I think he's really aggressive playing off man. And the Eagles tend to play some of that as well. So Johnson could be a very interesting fit as well in the Jim Schwartz defense. Um, who else did you mention? Uh, Johnson, anybody who you thought like the AJ Terrell, Fulton, anyone who falls in yeah. your mind in that really good cover one, cover three man type scheme. Yeah. I mean, look, any LSU corner, plays a lot of man coverage. I mean, that's what LSU does. I mean, LSU and Ohio State have become sort of the man corner factories. Um, Fulton was fascinating to me. I know a lot of people love him. Um, and his tape was littered with, with plays where his balance and his body control were problematic, where he took false steps. But in college, he always seemed to recover and make plays. So the question is, Number one, can that be coached? And number two, is that going to happen in the NFL against better receivers? Uh, certainly played in the SEC, so he's playing against quality players. But, yeah, I thought there were con some concerns with him. Um, so so Fulton's interesting, but, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. He, he was a guy I kind of struggled with. Oh, Greg, let's turn our attention to safeties. Give us a, a little bird's eye view of some of the guys you've seen and uh, kind of how they fit at the next level. Well, you know, I think the game has changed to where sort of these multidimensional safeties, or now I guess the term people use is positionless defenders. Hmm. Um, I think Xavier McKinney fits that role. He kind of reminds me a lot of Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, who was a fourth-round pick last year, but played. I remember speaking with Dennis Allen, the D.C. for the Saints at the Combine, and he was telling me he played four or five different positions in their defense. And I think Xavier McKinney is kind of like that because he can play on the back end, He's probably not a pure post safety, single high safety, but he can do it. He certainly can play in split safety looks. Um, he, he played over the slot. He can drop down in the box. You know, he's one of those multidimensional players, you know, with that kind of skill set and that kind of position versatility. And I think he's really competitive. He's a really good blitzer. Um, so, you know, a guy like that, again, I don't know if he fits the Eagles exactly. I just think he's a really good player. Um, then you got the kid from LSU who's really fascinating, Grant Delpit. Over 6'2", played a ton of post safety. Um, he's rangy without being explosive. And there's a difference, but he mm. is rangy because of his length. He kind of has a stalking feel to his movement. Um, and I really like Delpit on tape. I think there were, he needs to work on his tackling. He was better as a tackler in 2018 than 2019. He does have a tendency, as by the way, a lot of college safeties do, of just throwing his body, you know, at, at ball carriers. But mm -hmm. I think he, he's capable of being a good tackler. So it's just his size that really intrigues me. And then you get another guy. The kid from Southern Illinois is really fascinating, too, Jeremy Chin. He's a ridiculously good athlete at 6'3", 221 pounds. And again, you have to understand, he's another one of those multidimensional guys. He's probably not a post safety. Um, you know, the question becomes with these guys, can they fill, let's say, a, a Malcolm Jenkins role? Although I happen to think Willie Parks can fill the Mal Malcolm, Will mm. Parks can fill the Malcolm Jenkins role because uh, I've seen a lot of Will Parks and I think he's actually a pretty good player. So maybe they're not going to be looking for that particular guy in the draft. Maybe they're looking more for a post safety and, uh, you know, and those guys are a little more difficult to find just because of the range that's required. Well, you know, Greg, I mean, the Eagles haven't used a high pick on a safety since I think the Truman administration. I don't so think they really, will this year either. <laughs> you don't think they will, huh? <laughs> no, because I think they signed Will Parks to, to be, to, for Malcolm Jenkins. I think that was the reason mm -hmm. for that signing, and I think he'll play that role. And uh, so, yeah, I don't think they're going to take a safety with their first two picks. Well, uh, I know Parks was on a one-year deal, and yeah. um, same thing with Mills, right? They brought him back to play a multiple hybrid role on a one-year deal. I, I, I almost feel like <laughs> if they if they continue to do this with safety, it's going to keep it's going to bite them in the rear end at some point because uh, well, they they just keep not prioritizing that position at all. You know, and it's funny you say that. I mean. You know, I've talked to defensive coaches over the years, and, and it's funny, on social media, and I know we're all on social media quite a bit, and it's it's that time of year with all the internet scouts and, and draft gurus. Um, <laughs> we did a podcast on that. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and that's fine. I mean, I'm not knocking anybody, but, you know, everybody talks about positional value. Yeah. And that's all. Oh, that's fine to talk about until you talk to coaches. I can't mm -hmm. tell you how many times I've talked to coaches 
who'll tell me, well, you know, I can't do what I want to do because I don't have a good safety. You know, stacked linebackers have become another thing where people have now decided that's not important. Mm -hmm. until coaches then tell you that, well, I can't really do what I want to do. I'm limited in my options and my flexibility defensively because I don't have this player. So it's always mm -hmm. easy to say that guys don't have, you know, positional value until you talk to coaches. Exactly right. Hey, 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 Greg, before we get out of here, uh, I do it because the teams are picking at the top that need a corner, the Jets, the Raiders, the Lions and other yeah. teams. Do you see a distinct difference between Okuda and Henderson? I think they're very similar stylistically. I think Okuda is a, is a little better, but I wouldn't say one's a 10 and one's a six. You know, they're both tall. They're both incredibly athletic. They both can play press man. They can play physical man. They can play off. You know, I think their traits are somewhat similar. If you're just looking at traits and skill set, I just happen to think Okuda is a little bit better. But like I said, I wouldn't say there's a – it wouldn't surprise me if there are teams that have Henderson rated ahead of Okuda, mm. but I, I like Okuda more. Let me ask you uh, on corners. Is there a day two guy or even like an early day three who you really – because I've heard uh, the kid from Pitt, Dane Jackson, I've heard his name mentioned a couple of times as a guy who might – uh, play well at the at the higher level. Uh, Bryce Hall was injured last year at Virginia. Some people really like his abilities. Damon Arnett from Ohio State has gotten a lot of. For I guess if he if he finds himself in the right type of zone scheme, that he might be a a, a really good corner because well, he keeps things in front of him. There's, the two guys I really like are Terrell and, and Gladney. Mm -hmm. uh, Terrell's over six feet. You know he's long. He's athletic. He can play press. Um, he's smooth. I really like him. Mm -hmm. And you have to watch the entire LSU game. People saw a couple of bad plays and figure that, oh, he got burned. That was not huh. the case if you watch the whole tape. Gladney will be fascinating. Gladney is actually just about the same size as Tredavious White. Now, mm -hmm. Tredavious White plays on the outside in the NFL, and he's really good. So the question for teams will be, is Gladney an outside corner, which is what he played in college, or do they see him as moving inside? I think he can do both depending on how you see him. But those two players I really, really like. Again, I can't pick where guys get drafted. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that history tells you that the two positions that end up with the most draft picks in pretty much every draft are wide receiver and corner. Right. So corners get drafted. Gladney, uh, interestingly, was uh, singled out by Denzel Mims when we had him on last they week. Had a great uh, he said that Gladney great was the toughest corner he's faced all mm -hmm. year. I watched that tape. They had a great – see, Gladney is super, super competitive. Mm -hmm. See, Gladney can play in the slot because he's really competitive both mentally and physically. And keep in mind, when you play in the slot, it's teams now line up with three wide on first and ten or second and four. So when you play in the slot, you have to be able to play receivers who have a two-way go. You've got to be able to play the run, and you've got to be able to blitz. So you can't just say put a guy in the slot because he's shorter. You know, there, there's a specific hmm. skill set now that slot corners must have in the NFL. Hmm. Greg, we, we can't thank you enough for coming on. It's been awesome to hear you break down these guys for us. We appreciate all of your wisdom, your insight. We know how much work you put in, so we value uh, everything you tell us. Um, I'm, let me just tell everybody again where they can find you on Twitter. It's at Greg Cosell, C-O-S-E-L-L. -L. You are NFL Films Senior Producer and, of course, the co-host, of the NFL matchup show on ESPN, which airs Monday, 7.30 p.m. Uh, on ESPN2 and Tuesday, 7 o'clock p.m. ESPN2. Did I miss anything? No, I think we're good. Well, we are good because we had you on the show, man. We really appreciate it. Appreciate Thanks it, so man. much Thanks. for joining us. Hey, thanks, guys. I really appreciate being with you. Thank you. All right. That is the great Greg Cosell. And we are going to pause right now for uh, another word from our sponsors. And then when we'll come back, it'll be Adam and I rounding out the podcast with some things we've heard leading up to the NFL draft. Thanks again, Greg. Thank you. All right, everyone. No sports, no problem. DraftKings Sportsbook has an endless amount of casino games to play from the comfort and safety of your own home. And right now, all first-time casino players on DraftKings Sportsbook can get up to $200 to play risk-free for the first 24 hours after downloading and signing up. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now and find the casino games in the top navigation bar to start playing Games? You want games? Choose from slots, blackjack, roulette, live dealer games, and more. DraftKings is a legal, safe, and secure than secure gaming app. You can deposit and withdraw your money at your convenience. Plus, DraftKings has new promotions every day, so be sure to check the app daily. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code ITB to play up to $200 of casino games risk-free. That's promo code ITB 
to play up to $200 risk-free for your first 24 hours of casino play on DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or over. New Jersey only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. All right, Adam, real quick, before we get into some other things, you know, obviously we just had Greg Cosell on. He was tremendous. One of my oh, biggest so takeaways yeah. from him at wide receiver was he is a big Denzel Mims fan. Yeah, how about that? I mean, it's interesting, Jeff. I I felt all along he would be a second-round pick. Top, he's a top-40 pick, okay? Mm-hmm. That's, that is the way the league sees him. Now, he could go in the back of the first round. You, you, you can't discount that because – when you're the 49ers, right, they, they want speed opposite Debo Samuel. That That's what I've been told for months. I still think that's the case. Who's to say that they wouldn't draft him, okay? the, the Dante Pettis has not worked so far. They're, lo- they're looking for a wide receiver. Um, 21 for the Eagles is a little bit early. Uh, they've done their work on Mims, just like they've done their work on a lot of these guys. Uh, they do like him. I don't get the sense that they would draft him at 21. Um, but, you know w- – we don't know what Howie Roseman's thinking, but I mm-hmm. just – just my intel says that the t- National Football League teams have them a little bit later. But I learned my a lesson with John Ross. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not comparing Ross to Mims, but in terms of being surprised by something. That No, that one was the shocker, that draft. When John Ross came out, I still – I'm still like – I haven't gotten over it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was just going the second round. He went, at, I think, maybe number nine to the Bengals, at like nine or ten. Nine. I'm still surprised how high Corey Davis and Mike Williams went in the in their. Oh, I'm going to disagree fantasy. with you. Like you and I were, you and I were working for 97.5 The Fanatic. Uh huh. And I had to go to defend. I had to defend the Titans. I said, look, he's a guy. that's really Corey Davis. He went to one of those like Central Michigan. Central Michigan, Western, Michigan I think. Yeah, yeah Western, like that. One of those. Yeah. 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 So he was a guy. That a lot of. A lot of Bit, like a lot of personnel guys like he, he did mm. the public didn't like him as much as personnel guys now he's been inconsistent um as we put on our show a couple weeks ago i was told that uh his issue is his issue is getting off press he's real good at zone he just doesn't pre- be pressed well enough mm-hmm. that's why he's not been as good as they probably had hoped right he's flash but he's been inconsistent um you know the mims stuff, i wasn't shocked that he was picked high by the way i just didn't think he yeah. was gonna be the fifth overall pick. right i get it i get it um yeah. but but with mims boy i i you know greg and i don't uh, greg and i talk he comes on a show with uh john hansen and i on uh every friday mm-hmm. on sirius xm fantasy sports radio it has for i don't know 15 years um we've talked to him about mims but i've not heard him that's the strongest i've heard him talk about mims another guy the only guy we didn't really get to i wanted to get to it receiver with him mm-hmm he loves LaVisca Chenault. I mean, he – he, and it's funny. Talking to receiver coaches, uh, Jeff, they all say the same thing. If he came out last year, he's a top 15 pick. Mm-hmm. But he's got such injury concerns, I just don't see him going in the first. You, you have to be as – as I wrote for our website, Jeff, you have to be so secure in your job that you're not worried about taking him late in the first because if he doesn't play for you in the year one, you're fine because you, you know you're not getting fired. You just got to be careful with him because he's got to get over this injury, these injury issues, which have been well documented. All right. Um, let, let's talk a little bit more about, you know, because now we, we record this on Wednesday, April 15th. So we're eight days away from the first round of the NFL draft, a little less since we're doing this at night, right? Yeah, and we're dropping and, it a week, exactly a week from the draft. So that's, you know, that, that's, that's right. Yeah. So let's try to figure out a little bit more first of all there's a lot of stuff out there and you know oh my god we've said this before we're not going to address every single what's week. happened this week what the hell's going on with these rumors? i don't know today in particular two different radio stations dropping like really big trade rumors but uh that happens we know it's a silly yeah. season all i can tell you is this from my homework i've looked into it um the okay. eagles are having quote-unquote strategy meetings uh coming up here to, like i said we're recording this wednesday so Thursday and Friday are strategy meetings. And in those meetings is when they kind of do that. Like, where are we? Where's the cluster of guys we like? What would it take to move up? What would we get if we move back? You know, that's all strategy. They're, they're tactical yeah. maneuvers. Sure. So they go all through all the scenarios. So, again, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Right. Yeah. If those yeah, meetings yeah. haven't taken place, it's hard to know it or it's hard to sit here and address rumors of the team definitely trading. And, and, and by the way, yeah, by the way, just, just, just you know, I'm not going to knock uh, our friend Joe Tordy at all. It, seemed, it was an interesting rumor. See, I wasn't even um, going to say the name, but you brought No, no, but I, I love Joe. Uh, we worked together a little bit. Uh, you, you know, Joe, you work with him. Uh, definitely. Great no, guy. But, but what I'm saying is mm-hmm. it's not. 
I, here's what I know about the Eagles in, in trading off for whatever position, the, the two positions they need, no matter what the fans think, trust me when I tell you this, it's, and I keep trying to get people to understand this. This will help people do mock drafts. Mm-hmm. When I, when my friend, you know, Tony Pauline, he, um, he's, you know, he's been draft expert for decades. Tony, I used, Tony and I used to do mocks for many years. And when I, when he and I would miss, it would always be because we were too narrow minded. We were not thinking about the future or think about now. Mm-hmm. The teams that know how to build teams, they, they're not worried about now. Yeah, they like to have a guy contribute year one. They hope they're hoping the guys with them for five to ten years, seven to ten years. So they're not yeah. where ten to twelve percent of the guys' careers year one. So, fo- so folks, when you say like, okay, well, the Eagles have to get the, the Eagles don't need a corner. Well, let's examine that, Greg, uh, Jeff. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, Sidney Jones has not worked out for three years. Okay, he's on the funny of his rookie deal. Right. He better produ- He better do something to to earn a roster spot in twenty twenty one. He'll be yeah. restricted, as we reported three months ago on our show. Mm-hmm. Um, if if who's to say if, if he doesn't play well, if he doesn't look like he can play in the National Football League, let, let's say he okay. Look, he's been a disappointment. Let's say he does. He's he, in, inactive half the season. He, he just doesn't earn a a game day roster spot. Who's to say they would even just, – I'm just spitballing this. I'm not saying it's, – it's an opinion. It's not a fact. But who's to say would, they would even tender him? No doubt. I, I agree mean, with you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, folks, they, and 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 I, I get what Roseman, Howie Roseman, their GM, said to the media a couple weeks ago. Um, you were talking about how they could play Avanti Maddox outside. He's definitely one of their four best defensive backs. Jeff, you'd rather not have a 5'9 corner on the outside. Yes, he can run. There's no question. He's, he was drafted to be their slot corner. Right. That, to me, is really where his future is. To think because they have four guys – well, you know, they, they have you can't draft anyone because they drafted Jones and Maddox and Douglas. Folks, you could have ten corners. It doesn't matter. It, what matters is who do you trust. Right. They don't trust anyone long-term on the outside. That's a fact. No, I, that, listen, you don't have to – I'm always a best available player guy. And, um, exactly. If, exactly. The, if a top-rated corner is there and the receivers went off the board early, I, you know, as much well, as well, I scream safety, and I, and I will – <laughs> yes. and I think Greg a little bit backed me up on that. Yeah, the yeah. Corner is a premier position, and there's not a lot of great yes, ones. Yes, so thank you. Now, 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 let, let, let me pick up what him. you just said, okay? Mm-hmm. You said if the, top, if the receivers aren't there – but but let me put it to you this way. And I I I, I looked at our um. We by the way we uh, we really appreciate the people in our new. You call it like a message board on Facebook. It, it's yeah, like, the, the the group, the community yeah, message group. Yeah, gr- yeah. community. And, and we're almost we're we're around four hundred in like six days. It's awesome. We 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 really appreciate. It. Well, Jeff and I are going to bounce in there in and out. But you know what? A couple guys are not happy. Like I that we've either mentioned corner or it's even out there. And and Jeff just mentioned how if the receivers great isn't there and that's the point yes we're not arguing that the eagles biggest need is receiver that's not even you can't even argue that it's a fact but you can't reach for a guy Mm -hmm. i don't quite i'm i'm still and as i've mentioned you know i put up a piece this week on uh for a mailbag i'm trying to figure out how they've graded uh iuk and rager and hamler and mims i still don't think mims would go to them at 21 it's not to say if they traded back, they wouldn't take him at 27. Um, I, they like him. He's on the four or five guys I think they'll look at. I don't know exactly who it's going to be. But to think, like, you can't take a corner there who's got the same grade because you need a receiver, mm-hmm. you got to be careful with that stuff. I, I, yeah. and, and, and Greg Cosell talks about it, it um, early in our show here about how deep this receiver class is. Now, you're, he's a little bit more – Greg's – Greg's analysis of Ayuk was even stronger than I'd gotten from people. Um, so, so maybe I'm going to be wrong on Ayuk. Maybe Ayuk goes at 21 or, or, or what I, what, what I really mean is maybe he goes a little bit earlier in the first round. I thought I, I had Rager and Ayuk almost identical 25 to 31 is what I'd heard. I, I put him at, I didn't rule out 20 or 21 mm-hmm. because both the Jaguars and Eagles need, need receivers. Right. But, but from talking to receiver coaches and personal guys, I trust, they put him back of the first round, but that doesn't really matter in terms of the reality that these, t- these teams need receivers mm-hmm. uh, and they're both pretty good football players. They're a little bit different. Um, I, that's kind of what it comes down to now. Now maybe I'm going to be wrong about Mims. Maybe the Eagles like him even more than I thought. So you, you have to kind of great. You have to look at the whole landscape of 
not just this year, but if you're doing a mock draft, do you want to figure it out? Try not to just focus on one year because that's not the way you build a football. Absolutely. And um, as we mentioned in the, I think the last podcast, I look at who's drafting after the Eagles from 22 to 27 and a few teams like the Vikings, the Saints, the Patriots, and, and the Seahawks that could always use a little bit more receiving threat. And I, and I worry about what they'd be giving up if they tried to move back a little bit too far. You know, maybe a spot or two. I think you can still get Mims or Rager or whoever. Okay, but any further, you know, you keep if you if you're trying to move six or seven slots down, you might lose out on two or three receivers you have high. So we'll see. We'll try to get more intel on that cluster and 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 come back. Just let me add this to you. So so I know we got Viking fans listening. Listen to what Cosell said about Ayuk. He he said he. he I mean, if you compare Ayuk, Rager, and Mims and some of the other receivers, mm -hmm. he did say Ayuk, Ayuk can do the explosive stuff. Now, it, his thing is he's talked about run after the catch. And you, you know, that's what Ayuk's known for. But listen to what Greg said. He's a little bit more explosive than we thought. Um, he throws a wrench. You're right, Jeff. Twenty. Let, let me give you the receivers, teams that are looking for receivers in the first two rounds, mm -hmm. from 20 to 32. Jaguars, 20. Eagles, 21. Vikings at 22. Patriots, you cannot roll it out. I know they drafted a receiver in the first round last year. They're, Edelman's up there. We know he's had some injuries. They've got Henry. They've got the kid from uh, ASU last year. They mm -hmm. still need receivers. The Saints probably wouldn't do it in the first round, but they they, they, they need someone to eventually replace Emmanuel Sanders. Mm -hmm. Vikings again at 25. Dolphins need everything. They need receivers. Sure. It's not what they need that high. You're right. I'm told by a pretty good source. The Seahawks are still looking for another deep threat. Don't mm -hmm. think it'll be in the first round. Titans absolutely need a field stretcher, but that they need they need pass rushers first. Packers, done deal, speed speed guy they're going to get in first or second round. Niners, we just talked about earlier, they need a speed guy. Mm -hmm. So if you're the Eagles, the Vikings, or some of these other teams, you how can you trade down to get a receiver when all these other teams need them. Yeah, maybe a spot or two, but nothing. anything after that, you're in the danger zone, in my yep. opinion. Yep. So, And how much do you really get by moving down one or two spots? So at the end of the day, I mean, we'll have to see. But uh, I, Take feel like the, Take I feel like guy, right? that is really, don't be afraid. Really, if you love – listen, I, I think we, we talk about this all the time. The draft is a projection. If you're the Eagles, if you feel that Mims, Rieger, Ayuk, any of these guys in three years is going to be – a Pro Bowl caliber or a thousand yard receiver with, you know, six to eight to 10 touchdowns and take him. Don't worry about the fact that he's not developed into that yet. That's your job. That's your coach's job. If you right, had, but they want right. you to do that. You're right. Jeff, you know, fans and you know, I've, I'm no different. I like to see guys do well early. They want instant gratification. They want the guy to be greater immediately. Right. Well, the, the problem is not only is that not realistic with what we're dealing with as a country, Mm -hmm. these players are not having an off season. So That's we didn't true. mention Justin Jefferson. The reason why coaches love Justin Jefferson. Plug and plush. You got it. And that's exactly why I think he still is in the conversation to go inside the top 20. He's a little bit safer. See, I wonder, and I'm going to, I'm going to make sure when we do our work for next week, I need to find out what personal people and coaches think. It's particularly the guy, the decision makers. Are they going to take Jefferson higher because they can't afford to – they can't be as patient because they need guys to play right away because of the offseason. They're not going to have one. They need, to, they need to go with a guy that, as you just said, plug and play. Like, we, 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 that's, a, that's a really good point, and that's something that, quite frankly, is probably going to play into this. Sure, sure. Real quick, uh, before we kind of get out of here, I want to go through uh, just a little bit of free agency left okay. or, or thing, you know, guys who we've, we've talked about in the past and, sure. and an update. Um, anything on quarterback? All right, so we first reported. And I asked yeah, because you just I brought up. Going here. Uh, yeah, you just brought up the biggest thing is the fact yeah. that there's not going to be a whole lot of OTA, maybe not training camp. Who knows what's going on? So they're yeah. trying to get a guy in who doesn't know your playbook. All right, so 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 you know we put out the Flacco stuff for anyone even even had a sniff of of what was going on there. So let me just kind of say where it's at. Mm -hmm. You know, Joe, there's mutual interest from both parties here. I, nothing's imminent. Nothing's really happening. He goes, I, I obviously have interest in bringing Josh McCown back. The way I understand it is they want to get through the draft first and just see what their roster looks like. Makes sense. Um, Joe is coming back with significant injury. So is McCown. It's, it's interesting. You know, Joe's obviously in the twilight of his career. I, my sense is, based on intel, is that he's wherever he goes, he's willing to be a backup. Um, Josh McCown knows he's a backup wherever he goes. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the Eagles, the Eagles, you know, l- really like Nate Sudfeld, but he's never started an NFL game. Um, that's right. just the reality that, that Nate was told that he'd have a, a, a real chance to win the number two job. He obviously knows this offense well. Uh, he's been in it now three years. Actually, this will be his fourth year. Hell, Jesus. Right. Christ. And that's big, by the way, knowing the yeah. offense well, because they need yeah, somebody. God. Where's the time gone? Is it seven? Uh, yeah. They got him in the fall 17. Yeah, this will yeah. be his fourth year, right? 17, 18, 19, yeah, 20. So, um, yeah, so so that's where that is. You know, running back, we got asked about LaShawn McCoy. He, here's the deal. The Eagles have interest in, you know, they, they have interest in getting a running back in this draft. Somewhere, you know, third day, maybe fourth or fifth round, possibly. Um, I think it'd still be with a guy with size. If they don't get a running back, Jeff, they're going to have to look at a running back, a veteran with some size and experience. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to rule LaShawn McCoy out uh, because he's a plug and play guy in terms of knowing the offense. But Mm -hmm. Jeff, the issue that you have is he was inactive as a healthy guy for the Super Bowl. Right. That's, you know, like, does he have anything left? But I was told that the Eagles have not ruled that out, bringing him in. Um, I wouldn't put up a high percentage on it. Um, The guy that I thought, that maybe they would have some interest in um, because he knows the offense is Spencer Ware. I'm mm-hmm. told they're not on him. Um, mm. uh, I think he now, a couple is- of weeks ago, I-, I brought up, I thought, you know, the longer he's out there, the better it is to get him on a, on a you know, a good deal or whatever. But a guy Sean? like oh. uh, Devonte Freeman from. Atlanta. Oh yeah. I-, I would, I see the thing is, yeah, he'd fit from a gosh, he's got a ton of experience and he's, you know, he's a good football player. He's had a bunch of injuries. Yeah. Um, see, Devonte Freeman's going to have to be realistic. Um, mm-hmm. you know, now that unless he gets signed before the draft, he's only got a week to do so. That whatever he thinks he might get, that money's going to be going down and down and down. Um, you know, he he has to understand wherever he goes, he's going to probably be the number two. Right. And that's just what he is right now. Um, he's not old, but it's to the point now. You have to ask yourself this question: if if you're a Devonte Freeman. Are you willing to accept not only a backup role, but to the point where it, you might be done starting? That's just kind of where he is. And um, well, you know what? He 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 just turned twenty eight. You figure he's got two years left in him, Jeff. But um, I would like him more than McCoy. But he's he's clearly going to cost you more than McCoy. He's younger than McCoy. He definitely has more left. But you also again get concerned about the injury. Now the last guy I want to talk about. I still get, and I bet you do too. I get fans reach out to me all the time asking me why Alshon Jeffrey is not on the team. And I keep saying the same thing. What purpose does it serve to just cut him right now for the sake of cutting him? He's hurt. He's got to get healthy. There is no football right now. Anyway, it's not like he can do anything in the locker room. I think it's a little overblown about his him in the locker room. To me, it's more that he wasn't a – he's an aging and not as productive player that he used to be. But if Howie Roseman can hold on to this guy – to the point where it's the next season, somebody needs a wide receiver, he can make a, a deal to get maybe something, anything in return, then why not? I don't understand the purpose of having to cut Alshon Jeffrey right now. Yeah, just a couple things. Number one, I've known this for the year. He's not disruptive. Uh, obviously, there's some stuff that's been attributed to him. Um, whether you want to believe it or not, um, that certainly factors into the player's evaluation. But – uh, I've talked to players about it, front office. He's not disruptive. I mean, I, I know that, again, you question some of the stuff that's been attributed to him, and that's fair game. Mm-hmm. But um, the issue, first of all, they've, they they owe him the base salary plus the option bonus. You're talking about over $11 million. Um, they're not going to cut him in owners. <laughs> it's not – I don't see any way they're going to cut him right now, as you just outlined. Um, it would behoove them just to wait till he gets healthy, When let's say by August – Right. Let's, let's assume he's running by July. They, they, they'll have a better idea on him. Hopefully that they're allowed to watch him in their own building because they can, we could, everyone could come back by then. We just don't know. Um, but I, I think – I know it's not going to stop people because everybody wants – they want a resolution. They don't need it. Jeff just outlined it. I couldn't do it any better, and I really – that's kind of where it is. They don't need to do anything. Right. All right. I want to thank our friends, Adam, at phlsportsnation.com continuing to enhance the fan experience with their coverage of the Flyers, the Sixers, the Phillies, the Eagles, uh, their podcast, their great content that they're churning out all the time. So head on over to phlsportsnation.com. Give their work a read. It's very good content. Uh, and that'll do it for Inside the Birds, the leading podcast in Eagles Intel. want to uh, give a big thanks to Greg Cosell of uh, uh, NFL Films and, of course, uh, the matchup show on ESPN. 
Uh, he does a great job, and I hope everybody really enjoyed his intel and his insight in going through these uh, college prospects. And I want to thank uh, our producer, Hunter Brody. Make sure you check out his work on YouTube, Sports Talk with Broads, and check him out on Twitter, at Broads81, as he continues to put out great content as well. Make sure you're visiting our website, Inside the Birds. Dot com. We've put up, uh, oh, Adam put up a mailbag. We've got uh, everything we did on wide receivers uh, last week in the podcast, we put in story form. We broke it up into two stories and gave you all of our sources uh, intel on each receiver along with their measurables. So if you haven't, if you hadn't heard the podcast yet, or you just want the, the, uh, what do they call it? The abridged cliff notes on these wide receivers and, and what NFL people think about them. You can go to inside the birds.com right now, check it out. And uh, we'll have some interesting news going forward. We've got some good stuff planned for next week, draft week. we got some videos. Adam, you don't even know this. I just got a text message. I think we're going to be joined. uh, We'll have a video with one of the college uh, football's better cornerback prospects. Oh. Corner, C-O-R-N-E-R back. Okay. Uh, We just have to work out time to get him on. And Andrew Jacecko helped us out with that. So we'd be awesome. big thanks to him. And um, I'm looking forward to it, man. We're we're one week away about, uh, and we're going to obviously have more stuff next week yeah and, we're gonna uh, get, we're gonna narrow it down i know people want us to go okay who are they taking i, yeah. I don't do that until i feel good about it I, I by the way just to give you an idea of how late i get information so jeff and i were working for the fanatic in philly in 2017 you know the, the draft that was done here and, mm-hmm. and i don't know like an hour before the draft i said it's going to be it's going to be um mccaffrey who just signed his monster deal uh, i said that's who it's going to be and then I later found out if they didn't get that done, it was going to be Dalvin Cook. Um, something complicated it, but um, that so 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 I still don't think they'll do a linebacker in the first round. I, I just don't. But they were willing to they were willing to break the mold and running back Jeff for the first time in over thirty years. Mm-hmm. I just don't see a true linebacker going in the first round, but we shall see. All right, and last person I want to thank. I was remiss last podcast when I thanked our interns uh, from Temple, Mike and Zanee, for helping us oh, yeah. with the uh, Facebook page. I also want to thank Phil. Awesome. Phil has done a great job. Phil Gallinol, who uh, I got to meet this guy player. when we can. Yeah, I got to meet this guy. I don't know if you should meet. I think Phil's better off if you just don't know who he is. Adam. No, I'm just kidding. Phil's a great <laughs> dude. And he's, been, <laughs> he's been doing great work. So uh, we we say thanks to Phil, and of course we thank you for flying with us inside the bird. If you're listening to this, you obviously like podcasts, and you probably like music too. On Spotify, you can listen to all of that in one place for free. That's right. You don't need a premium account. On Spotify, you can follow your favorite podcast so you never miss an episode. You can download episodes to listen to offline wherever you are. You can easily share what you're listening to with your friends via Spotify's integrations with social media platforms like Instagram. Spotify has a huge catalog of podcasts on every topic, including the one you're listening to right now. Just search for Inside the Birds on the Spotify app or browse podcasts in the Your Library tab. And follow me, Jeff Mosher, so you never miss an episode of Inside the Birds. Spotify is the world's leading music streaming service, and now it can be your go-to for podcasts, too.